MP for Stoke Central and the Labour Party's uh, Shadow Education Secretary, and Christine Blower, the General Secretary of the National Union of Teachers. Uh, just before we start, um, just we have the usual things. Um, in the case of fire, uh, which I'm sure is very unlikely, um, lights will go out and things will start flashing and um, the exit doors down at the back. If you go through the back exit door, there's another exit door immediately opposite you and you're asked to assemble under the Tesco sign. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion, um, but I am going to finish the meeting very promptly at 8.30 because both Christine and Tristram uh, have to catch trains back to London and we have to get them to the station in time. Um, so without more ado, I'll start off by asking Tristram to speak for about 20, 25 minutes, something like that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. This is an uh, excellent meeting. I want to thank Christine for coming uh, from the NET. I want to thank the North Staffs Trade Council. I want to uh, thank the Pensioners uh, uh, Convention. Um, what I want to focus on this evening is the Labour Party's uh, policies for uh, education uh, and then also uh, the challenge here in Stoke-on-Trent. And I think it's uh, wonderful to be thinking about both of those themes, because when we think about the role and function of education within the labour movement, it is so much more than just a question of funding agreements between uh, academies or Ofsted inspections or lead tables. Uh, the labour movement has always regarded education as the vehicle for social mobility, as the vehicle for social justice, as part of our uh, focus on aspiration and ambition. When we look at the history of the labour movement and education, then here in Stoke-on-Trent there's a very, very proud uh, history, uh, not least with the Workers' Education Association, uh, whose work uh, continues uh, today. We should also, I think, remind ourselves of the achievement of the last Labour government um, in education. It's fashionable now to think that the Labour government, like the Romans, did nothing for us. Um, but when we think that the last Labour government built the first new hospital in Stoke-on-Trent for 140 years, it also rebuilt so many uh, of the schools in Stoke-on-Trent. And if you look at the new uh, facilities at Thistley Huff, or the Discovery uh, Academy, and you think of the excellent learning facilities that young people uh, have there. That is also a testament to the achievements of the last Labour government. David Blunkett's focus on literacy uh, and numeracy, uh, his focus on raising standards right from the beginning, uh, was a hugely powerful contribution here in Stoke-on-Trent as well. Then we look at the Shore Start Centres. Then we look at the trialling of the educational uh, maintenance allowance here in Stoke-on-Trent uh, uh, to begin with. And we also look uh, at the sponsored academy programme. There was a great deal of achievement in terms of education policy by the last Labour government. Uh, and in my view, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that. But the landscape we will inherit um, in eight months' time in 2015 will be, will be very, very different indeed. In terms of secondary schools, it will be a majority academised uh, system. It will be a much more uh, divided, uh, competitive, uh, almost atomised school system that we're going to have to begin to think about a rebinding uh, together. Uh, we've had a chaotic introduction uh, of exam and curriculum reforms, a timetable delivered uh, for politics rather than education. And again, we're going to have to uh, come in and make some sense uh, of a completely uh, disorganised system. And then we've had cuts hitting the most disadvantaged in the education uh, system. Um, we have a wonderful sixth form college here in Stoke on Trent that has to pay VAT, uh, but the academies uh, and, and other schools don't. Uh, we've had 17.5% uh, cuts to 18-year-olds in education uh, because some of them are in their third year of education. Uh, and these are exactly the kind of people uh, who we want to remain in education, uh, to keep learning, uh, to keep uh, uh, studying. And that's where the coalition have directed uh, the cuts. 
So we will pick up the pieces. That is the historic function uh, of the Labour Party after the chaos created uh, by a Conservative administration. Uh, and we're going to deliver an education system which works for all young people, which delivers young people out of it who are career ready, uh, college ready, life ready. And I want to tell you briefly this evening about uh, our three priorities in office. It begins in the early years because we know that you have to dis tackle disadvantage right uh, at root. Uh, we have to build upon our success of the sure starts and the children centres because if you're not working in those 0 to 3, 0 to 5 age groups, you're building up a cycle of disadvantage which it makes it even harder then uh, to tackle at primary, secondary, uh, sixth form or further education and college. We achieved an enormous amount in office with our short starts, but when we think about taking them into the future, what we're interested in from a Labour Party perspective is focusing on the quality of the personnel involved in delivering those early years because we need uh, young children uh, being exposed uh, to the best possible uh, personnel involved in playing with them, in teaching them, uh, in, in helping young mothers to nurture their children. And so what we want to do in office is to make sure we're getting the right quality personnel attracted into the early years. We also know that young families who have two parents at work are much less at risk of suffering poverty uh, and disadvantage. So the Labour Party is also committed to 25 hours a week of free childcare for three and four year olds of working parents. And that will be a real help uh, with most of the time, mothers struggling to go back to work, are wanting to get those extra hours, wanting to ensure uh, that they bring in a, a good income into the household. What we're also keen on is making sure that we've got our primary schools open from 8am to 6pm. We want wraparound facilities at these schools. Uh, as I always say to teachers in the audience and to Christine, it doesn't mean teaching no, from 8am uh, to 6pm. Uh, this means having the breakfast clubs available there uh, early in the morning. It means having the after school uh, clubs so we can get young people the meals they need in, in the morning. But then we can have the sports clubs and the chess clubs and the coding clubs and the homework clubs uh, and all those other extracurricular activities if young people want to pursue them on school sites. When we've got money being taken out uh, of cities like Stoke on Trent, when we've got money being taken out uh, of our infrastructure. Schools remain really important parts of the community uh, and we're often not using these facilities enough and it's the same with youth clubs and youth provision at a later stage uh, as it is um, in the early years. Our second area of focus is on schools uh, policy and here uh, we really do differ from, from the coalition government. The, the vision of the coalition government is that the type of school makes all the difference. So uh, free schools are better, uh, converter academies are better, uh, some schools are better than other in terms of their structure. We take a much more value neutral approach to the type of school, whether it's uh, an academy, a maintained school, a voluntary controlled school. What, what we think is most important is the quality of teaching in the classroom. Um, and no education system can exceed the quality of what takes place in the classroom. So our number one focus in education policy is working with the trade unions, with the professional bodies, with the teachers themselves to make sure that we get a world-class teacher in every classroom, every studio, um, every college that we have. And there are a number of tools we can use to make sure we improve the quality of teaching. This doesn't mean we have bad teaching. But it does mean we can always improve. It does mean we can get better year upon year upon year. Um, and this also isn't a question of, you know, as it were, somehow getting rid of all the bad teachers, bringing in other teachers. What I'm passionate about is working on how we improve all those teachers working today. And that means the professional development of teachers. And we don't put nearly enough focus and effort and resources upon this, both at school level uh, and at government level. So we've got a number of policies to focus on the professional development of teachers to make sure that year upon year upon year we get the quality of teaching better in the classroom. And for the Labour Party, for the Labour movement, this is a social justice issue because 
We know that young people who are exposed to poor teaching, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, from poor communities exposed to bad teaching, suffer exponentially because they don't have the books and the support and the structure at home. So they are even more reliant upon great teaching in the classroom. And if they don't have that, then they're going to suffer even more than those kids from more advantaged backgrounds who can make up some of that loss uh, at home, who can make up some of that loss with broader support. So from a Labour Party perspective, focusing on teacher quality uh, is our number one priority in schools policy. We also know that schools don't succeed as islands. Schools work best when they're in a relationship of partnership and challenge with one another. One of the great achievements of the last Labour government was something called the London Challenge programme, which transformed educational prospects in London. Um, if you want to be uh, the, the, the best place to be poor in terms of your educational prospects today is London. And that just was not the case 10 or 15 years ago. But the challenge today is, is, is not London. The challenge today is the Isle of Wight or Hereford or Wolverhampton or Grimsby or Norfolk. Uh, we're seeing too much disadvantage in terms of educational outcomes uh, outside of London. And so that has to be our focus. So we take those tools and what London Challenge was about was schools working in partnership and challenge learning from each other, uh, sharing excellence between each other, being quite tough with one another, having a no excuses culture. And that raised a remarkable levels of achievement. So what we want to do is end this very atomised, competitive school system that we have at the moment and promote partnership, collaboration and cooperation uh, between schools. And we're going to do that through a new system. Uh, we're going to introduce directors of school standards who are the figures who are going to knit together our schools at a local level. Because we've also learned from the worrying and terrible events in Birmingham that where you don't have systems of democratic oversight and accountability, where you have all these isolated schools doing their own thing, sometimes falling prey uh, to radical and worrying influences, this not only takes schools in the wrong direction, it can also affect uh, the standards. So we will, in a, in a very fragmented landscape that we'll inherit, reintroduce oversight and accountability at a local level to make sure schools work together because we think A, that's the right thing, and B, uh, we know it raises standards. The third area of schools policy I want to touch upon is is the syllabus, is, is the curriculum, is, is what is taught. Um, we've seen in recent years uh, an ever more ferocious concentration um, on the exam factory model, on, on the churning out uh, of young people from uh, school without some of the broader attributes that we want young people to enjoy from school. We saw in some of those schools in Birmingham which technically could do very well, but they weren't enjoying art or music or drama. And we must make sure that in the drive for achievement, we also have these broader attributes, um, these broader courses in the curriculum. Not only because it's good in and of itself that young people experience uh, these, these wonderful elements of culture and learning and sport, but we also know that young people who have this extracurricular activity, this non-formal learning, this learning outside the classroom, do better in the classroom. Those schools which do more sport, which practice uh, more drama, which have school councils, which have school assemblies, which do those other elements of school life, then begin to achieve more when it comes to the examinations. We've got kids doing 13, 14 GCSEs. Um, I think this is too much. I think we should actually uh, have those other elements uh, of school life which feed in uh, to, to, to make success uh, achievable. And we know from some of the up-to-date evidence that this building of character, of resilience, of, of grit, all those other broader elements of education help young people succeed in the long run. So we need to introduce systems into our schools to allow uh, space for this extracurricular uh, activity, uh, to make sure teachers have the space and capacity uh, to do it and to make sure it's valued by head teachers. Our third, air, our third area of policy, third and final area of policy, is Ed Miliband's absolute 
passion, um, which is what he's called uh, the forgotten 50%, which is those young people who are not pursuing, a tech, who are not pursuing uh, an academic route um, into university, those young people who want to pursue a technical and vocational pathway. This, this year we're celebrating, or commemorating, or acknowledging uh, the 70th anniversary of the Butler uh, Report, which set up our post-war education system. It set up the grammars, uh, it set up the modern schools, uh, and it was also meant to set up the technical schools. Uh, but it failed, famously, on the third leg. Uh, and whilst the Germans managed to introduce a very good stream of technical and vocational schooling, we failed uh, to do that. And we have to right that wrong. Not only uh, because it makes sense for young people who don't want to pursue academic pathways, and I meet so many young people who began AS levels and AE levels, decided it wasn't for them, went off to become an apprentice, went and did a course uh, at Stoke College, uh, enjoyed it, began to develop a fulfilling career like that, and felt angry that they weren't offered those uh, opportunities earlier. We also know it makes sense for our economy. Um, we need 70,000 uh, technicians a year for our economy to grow uh, and we're producing from our education system only about 40,000 a year. This is really holding economic growth back in this country uh, as well as the prospect of fulfilling careers for young people. So we want to rebuild our apprenticeship system, uh, we want to have high quality apprenticeships uh, uh, lasting two years at level three uh, with, a, with a job at the end of it. Uh, a a six-month work placement at Morrison's is not an apprenticeship. Uh, that is not going to give you the broader skills you need to succeed uh, in a sector. We've had a devaluing of apprenticeships uh, under this government, particularly youth apprenticeships, uh, and we'll put a stop to that. Secondly, we have to make sure that our further education colleges, our great further education colleges, are focused on the local labour market to make sure they're delivering courses uh, and jobs uh, that uh, are relevant to the local uh, economy. Uh, that means those teaching uh, in further education colleges have experience of industry, are in and out uh, of the jobs uh, that are relevant uh, to their sectors. And we're also going to make young people take maths and English to 18. We're very bad in this country at continuing to teach maths and English, uh, and it holds our young people back. So we will keep maths and English uh, until um, 18. Meshing this all together is rebuilding a system of careers guidance. One of the great crimes of this government is to destroy our careers guidance system. Um, the other thing is schools have, sadly, not enough interest in telling young people about all their options because the money follows the pupil and they often want to hold on to the pupil. A lot of colleges in Staffordshire can't get into local schools to tell them about uh, the options that are available uh, to them. So we need an effective careers guidance system and again from a labour perspective this is a social justice issue because those young people without the networks and the internships and the support at home need as effective advice as possible uh, to make sure uh, that they've got the best options available to them. Finally let me say something um, about where all this meshes with Stoke on Trent, because I'm absolutely passionate uh, that all of the policies uh, we develop um, from a Labour Party perspective have to deliver here in Stoke on Trent. Uh, and we've got particular challenges um, in our school system. We've had a really big focus uh, on, on, on improving the teaching uh, of literacy in our schools. We've had Ofsted working with us uh, on this. We've got schools who do it brilliantly. Um, and we've got schools who don't focus on it nearly enough. And it comes down, which is why I'm so passionate about this, to the quality of teaching, to those teachers who have the skills and the capacity and the learning to be able to deliver it. Um, and if they don't have that, we need to make sure that they're getting the training and the support and the examples from other schools to deliver that. Because if our kids are going into secondary school uh, with uh, a strong reading ability, it's even more difficult uh, to catch up later. So the focus on teacher quality absolutely speaks to the challenges we face here at Stoke on Trent. So, do, so does talking about collaboration and partnership between and among schools. We've got great heads in the city working together, but the system is almost uh, pushing them not to work uh, with one another, not to allow colleges in to talk to uh, their kids, not to think about uh, sometimes the kids' best interests uh, at where, where, where they could go to elsewhere. So we need to make sure that we've got systems which ensure that all our schools work together, they're not 
cannibalizing each other, they're not poaching off one another, there's actually collaboration and partnership uh, between them. And we also know um, that we need to do much more uh, to make sure that we're feeding our growing manufacturing sector, our growing industries here. It's great news that Goodwin Engineering are beginning their apprenticeship school. It's great news uh, that JCB are hiring more. It's great news uh, that Michelin does all its work. But our school system needs to be much more attuned to making sure that we're delivering the education and training for those young people who want to go that route, as well as all those brilliant young people in Stoke on Trent uh, who want to go an academic route uh, into, into university. And the great thing is that we can do it. And you will know that there are brilliant Shaw Start centres here, there are brilliant schools uh, at primary and secondary level uh, which are doing this and delivering for their young people. Our challenge is to spread that excellence, is to make sure we have great teachers everywhere, to make sure we have partnership and collaboration between and amongst our schools to deliver for all the young people in Stoke-on-Trent. And my, my challenge to you is to make sure that every policy we put forward from a Labour perspective is going to deliver here in Stoke-on-Trent and if you think it's not going to deliver here in Stoke-on-Trent, you need to tell me. Thank you. Um, thanks very much Tristram for setting out uh, the Labour Party's uh, vision for education. <clears throat> I think that perhaps at the beginning of the meeting I should have introduced myself because maybe not all of you know who I am. My name is Jason Hill. I'm the president uh, currently of the North Staffordshire Trade Union Council and a retired teacher. And like Tristram, I'm a member of the Labour Party and like Christine, I'm a member of the National Union of Teachers. <laughs> so I'd now like to um, welcome Christine Blower. I think this is your first visit to Stephen Trent for many years, isn't it? Is, it is actually. Yeah. So, Christine Blum, please. Well uh, please, it is my first visit in many years, but I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And, and can I say that I don't always get the opportunity to spend a lot of time with politicians, but I started this morning in Port Colour South with Nicky Morgan, oh. and I'm finishing this evening with Tristram Hunt, oh. so there you are, you see. Uh, they, they really, really do want to listen to what the National Union of Teachers has got to say. Um, I, we, we, we're meeting this evening just ahead of the TUC. So just before I say, uh, I mean, partly in response to Tristan, but also what the National Union teachers think about education, I, I just want to say that next week will be the meeting of the Trade Union Congress where all trade unions will be getting together and there will be significant things on our agenda. Uh, I think they all probably subsume into, uh, into pensions and pay and public services. And that kind of sounds like uh, vested interest or self-interest or whatever, but actually, if you look at the agenda for the Trade Union Congress, what underlies that is uh, our deep-seated conviction that we need a better and fairer society. So, for example, after Congress on October the 18th, the TUC will be running a big, big demonstration uh, in London, uh, October the 18th, on the, on the premise that Britain needs a pay rise. So, I am going to come on to say to you know, talk about all of the things that, uh, that Tristan has said. But I think it's absolutely vital that what we hear from the Labour Party ahead of, uh, of the general election is that there is a real acknowledgement that although there may be a sense that the economy is turning around in some bits of society, there isn't a thoroughgoing sense that the economy is turning around everywhere. And I, I absolutely agree with everything that Tristan said uh, about the early years and everything that he said about the need to make sure that every child and young person has the very best opportunity of education that they can. But the fact is that the very best education system in the world can't eradicate the fact that we have children living in grinding poverty at the moment and it's really incumbent upon the Labour Party to be putting in challenges to make sure that, as Tristan says, two working parents is the best opportunity you know, provides probably the best opportunity for a child to make sure that they have a good start. But it has to be two people working in proper jobs. It can't be two people working on zero hours contracts. I mean, something that's zero hours really shouldn't be given the name contract, because frankly, it isn't a contract, is it? It's a bondage. You have to stay at home until somebody says you can come to work. So, we, so in the education service, we are deeply concerned about 
the bedroom tax. I know the Labour Party was supporting uh, what the Lib Dems were doing today about the bedroom tax. We are deeply concerned about the very, very unequal society that we've got. And we absolutely agree that education is one of the ways that we can begin to move uh, young people out of poverty. Now, for a long time, we've been running a campaign that we've been calling Stand Up for Education. And we have now come to the point where we have produced uh, the NUT's Manifesto for Education under the same slogan of Stand Up for Education. I, I should say that we believe in the National Union of Teachers and no one will uh, deter me from this belief that the, the fact that we've been running the Stand Up for Education campaign, the fact that we've been talking about what parents wanted, the fact that we've been exposing some of the things that Michael Gove was doing which were utterly terrible, helped in his demise. And I have to say that meeting Nikki Morgan this morning, although she's coming across slightly differently from Michael Gove, she didn't actually give us any hope that the policies were going to change, just that her presentation uh, might be a bit different. But nonetheless, we have to, uh, we have to give her the chance to see whether she really is going to do anything different. So, uh, in, in response to, uh, to what Tristan has said, in terms of the broad perspective of the way Labour Party policy looks like developing, there are obviously, we, we would obviously, in the National Union of Teachers, agree with uh, the broad sweep of those things. Tristan didn't say this, he talked about he talked about having the best quality people working in early years and in our schools. He didn't actually say, and they must be qualified teachers, but we've had this discussion before, and I know that the Labour Party uh, has, has said all along, from the time when Michael Gove started talking about the fact that we can basically have anyone swallowing in off the street to be a teacher, that actually that isn't, uh, that isn't what the Labour Party stands for. I hope too, though, that the Labour Party will be looking at how we actually train and educate our teachers. Because I have to say, in the National <coughs> Union of Teachers, we, we have got a problem with both Teach First and School Direct, uh, because we don't think that there is sufficient and the sufficient quality of training being offered to young people. Now, you may not be familiar with School Direct, but essentially, uh, it seems to us in the National Union of Teachers that the idea is that you Velcro somebody next to a teacher who's doing a halfway decent job and, uh, and somehow or other they're supposed to learn that that's how you are a teacher. Now, you know, I think anyone who knows anything about teaching knows that that is not how you learn to be a teacher. You learn to be a teacher by having, uh, obviously, obviously classroom experience and classroom practice, but also by being able to be in institutes of uh, of higher education so that you have the time to reflect and to think about pedagogical styles and think about child development and so on. So it's, uh, it's important to us that the Labour Party says that teachers should be qualified, but it's also important that, that we think about how those young people will be qualified. It's also critically important to us that, uh, that schools are the hub of the community. So no, you won't get any pushback from us about the idea of schools being open for longer times. Although, I have to say, there are some children for whom the prospect of being in school from eight till six does not actually fill them with joy. Um, and, and actually a lot of doing other things outside of the school building can be just as useful and valuable and helpful. And if it were that the youth service or the play service were putting on things between four and six, that would be you know, possibly even a more attractive proposition. What we, what we absolutely uh, agree with Tristan about too is that this is not just though a matter of saying and teachers will do this. Uh, other jurisdictions in other parts of the world do have integrated systems where education, i.e. You know, the core job of teachers, teaching, dealing with the curriculum, happens during the teaching hours. But around that, you do have all the kinds of things which Tristan was talking about and which I'd be very happy to see. I mean, the, uh, the place service and the youth service are really not things that feature very largely in lots of authorities now, and that is something that we would really want to, to get back on the agenda. Let me say that the National Union of Teachers has some brilliant policy about teaching through play in the early years. I'm sure these are documents that we've given you, Tristan, and I'll just say that when we first produced them, we had a debate on this at our conference, um, talking about the centrality and importance of play. Uh, and a woman came to the rostrum to talk about teaching through play and the centrality of play. 
And she said, and I, I was thinking, you know, I teach in early years, but actually this is just as important in primary schools, and actually it's just as important in secondary schools. And then she said, and I thought, actually, play is just as important really throughout your entire life. But when I Googled adult play, you wouldn't want to know what I found. So, so there are, there is, but there is a proper place for play and recreation, and that brings me to one of the things that I, I, I really hope that the Labour Party is going to be saying, which is that at, at the moment we have, um, we have some of the longest working hours of teachers anywhere uh, in this country. The, uh, the, there's been a 10% increase in the number of hours that teachers work under this current government. It had actually begun to go down a bit uh, under the previous Labour government. And the thing with that is that they're not productive, useful, helpful hours spent producing interesting lesson plans, engaging the students in a proper way. It's about the dead hand of Ofsted. So we do have to tackle the fact that the notion of accountability in our system has come to mean box ticking and the fear of Ofsted and doing things because of Ofsted. And, and actually, we all know that that isn't the best kind of education. I'm not saying for a second that teachers shouldn't be accountable. Of course they should. But in, uh, in some other jurisdictions, in particular in Finland, for example, which you know we all know and we tout about all the time, is the most successful jurisdiction uh, in Europe in terms of the OECD tests. What they have is a much better balance between trust, which is very high, and the actual business of accountability, which is very low. Now, I'd be very happy if we could just get them more into balance. And I think that some of the things that Tristan was talking about, in particular in talking about the London Challenge, I'm pleased that I was teaching in London uh, when that happened, I should when the London Challenge happened, I have to say, um, you know, when we first saw it, those of us who were branch secretaries of the NUT went, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if that looks all right, it won't look like a lot of work. But actually, as soon as we looked at it, we saw, although this is actually what we want to do, this is what we want to do, we do want to collaborate across schools. Um, and of course, one of the problems that we've got at the moment is that academies and free schools don't really want to do that. Um, and, and even, as you say, Christian schools that are not academies and free schools don't necessarily want to do it because of the whole business about competitive uh, recruitment. So we want to see all schools back onto a level, uh, a playing field, and we want them to work together, and we want them to be uh, effective, self-effective, and, and self-improving, and we believe that can happen, because as Tristram says, London used to be the least well-performing region of the country, and now it actually is uh, the best-performing region of the country, although, I should just say, we were always a region that did very well by children with special educational needs and children from poorer backgrounds, so, you know, perhaps what we didn't do is have our eye on the ball across uh, everything, but we, we have made some significant improvements in that direction. So. In our manifesto, we are saying that we do need to address the fractured system that, uh, that, that Tristan has talked about. Now, you know, you, uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher's union trade unionist, you'd expect me to say this. One of the other things that we think we need to address is that uh, this current government has removed the national pay scale for teachers. Now, we think that this is a problem because we, we know, don't we, that there are some areas of, uh, of England, I'm only really talking about England and Wales, because that's where we organise, where salaries are, uh, are more depressed than others. And actually, we think that if you don't have a national system of paying teachers, there, will be, there may potentially be difficulties in recruiting teachers to uh, lower uh, areas of salary. Now, I very much hope that that won't be the case, but actually, we think there's a fairness about, uh, about having a, a pay scale that goes uh, across the whole um, system. And incidentally, although I speak very, uh, very fondly of Finland, one of the things that is interesting is that they don't have one of the things that has been very good in the future of, uh, of education, of the education pay arrangements in this country, is that they don't actually pay early years qualified teachers as well as they pay primary teachers as well as they pay secondary teachers. So don't take a leaf out of that book, please, because actually we believe that the job of teaching is the job of teaching, and very many elements of it, uh, you know, some elements of it are more difficult in some phases, and some elements are more difficult in other phases, but actually what we need is a coherence to that. Uh, and then, of course, we absolutely need to address the school places crisis. 
The fact is that this, this government has wasted an inordinate amount of money on its, uh, on its vanity project of free schools. And it's true that some free schools have opened up in places where there was a need for new school places, but equally very many of them haven't. And what that does is it wastes public money and it unsettles the existing provision. So we would like to see the end of the free schools uh, arrangements. I, I hear what um, Tristan says about it's not about what the name is on the board outside the school, it's about what you do inside the school. And that I can go along with that to some extent, but it does have to be that schools have a kind of coherence about the way they're governed and the way they relate to their local community and their local authority. Uh, and one of the things that we, we genuinely believe, and it's really interesting actually, because we're joined in this um, by the previous chair of the Local Government Association, who was actually a Tory. He says, by giving the power to create schools back to councils, Governments could ensure places for children from the ages of 4 to 18 can be delivered according to local demand in line with the local needs uh, of parents and their children. And I, I have to say that although we're, we're looking at what the Labour Party is saying about the Director of School Services, School Standards, we, we do think that there is a proper role for the local authority and we would like to see the local authority back having the responsibility uh, to commission schools. We obviously, uh, we obviously think that education shouldn't be run for profit, so there I agree exactly with Tristan. Uh, Nikki Morgan, I asked Nikki Morgan this very question this morning. She said, well, there appears to be a consensus that education shouldn't be run for profit. I'm not trying to unsettle that. But if people want to say things to me, uh, you know, I'm very happy to read them. Now, it seems to me that that's, that's a bit more weaselly than we heard from Michael Gove, even, because actually one of his... One of his last outings uh, as Secretary of State for Education, when he, uh, he clearly didn't know that his demise was coming, which is very interesting, but anyway, uh, on one of his last outings, he did actually say that he had ruled out the idea of schools for profit. Um, and I, you know, it's very interesting that Nicky Morgan uh, is appearing to reopen that. And we're, we're very pleased that there was a robust response to that. Because frankly, I mean, if you think about it, it's just theft, really, isn't it? You know, I mean, public money goes into the system to run it. Your money, my money, Tristram's money, everybody's money goes in to run the system. And if what we then have is some private corporation making a profit out of that, then that's just stealing public money. It's not the right thing to do. And, uh, and we're very pleased that the, um, that the Labour Party has set its face against that. The, the TUC produced a report earlier this year called Education Not For Sale. And it's very interesting that even though, in theory, we haven't got, well, in practice, we haven't got schools that can actually directly make a profit, listen to this, between May 2010 and December 2013, the DfE paid £76.7 million pounds to 14 private companies providing legal, accountancy, management, consultancy, and property services support to academies and free schools. That's a very great deal of money, as well as the money that was taken out of the general schools budget in order to open free schools. So you can see that what we have at the moment is okay, not schools directly run for profit, but a lot of siphoning of public money um, into other places. I'm, I'm going to say a couple of words about, about the curriculum because um, I know it, I know it comes from the forgotten 50%, but we in schools we don't think we have forgotten. You know, we think that we are doing, we're attempting to do a, a jolly fine job uh, with everyone who walks through our doors. But of course there is a problem with the curriculum having been persistently changed and, and what is considered to be of value by people beyond the individual school dates. And uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm going to offer Tristan the opportunity to say, because I think you may very well say Tristan, but I haven't heard you, is that one of the one of the wicked things, and I, I say I mean I mean wicked not in the young person's sense of wicked, but in the you know, the original sense of the word wicked that this government has done was to remove speaking and listening from the English exam halfway through when young people in this cohort uh, were actually taking their exams. I think it was a terrible thing to do. And what's very interesting is that although you will not be surprised to hear that the NUT doesn't very often have a coincidence of policy interest with the CBI, 
Uh, the fact is that the CBI absolutely agreed with us that speaking and listening are central skills. They should be part of the English GCSE. They should have been taken out by Ofqual in this government, and they should be reinstated. Um, and I, I'm, you know, there, there is there may be a discussion about you know how we uh, how we assess these things. But frankly, if we trusted teachers better and we afforded them all of the CPD on assessment systems. Um, that, uh, that Tristan has talked about the need for CPD. I think we would be in a better, uh, we would be in a better place, place to be able to say absolutely, we are confident that our teachers can do this. And that takes me to the question of testing in a general sense. Um, we, we, as I'm sure you know, are now testing very young children using what the government uh, started off trying to call the reading test. Well, if you've seen what this test is, you will categorically know that it's not about reading. It's about decoding. It's the phonics check. And uh, it's, a, it's, a test of, it's a test of a number of items that uh, young children, five-year-olds, have to decode, because reading actually involves comprehension and, and that kind of thing, whereas these things are not about comprehension, they're about decoding. Um, and, and in a very real sense, we are actually testing nonsense because some of the items in the tests are nonsense words or they're, they're nonsense syllables being put together to see whether kids can decode them. And the great thing about this is that these, this is not something which teachers may use as part of their battery of checking whether kids uh, have grasped phonics or not. It's a test that every child has to do and their parents have to be told whether they've passed it or failed it. Now, you know, I have a granddaughter, at the moment she's not quite three, but I don't really want one of her early experiences uh, in statutory education to be whether she passes or fails the phonics check. So, and, and I also don't want her only to be taught to read by someone who thinks that decoding phonics is the only way you can learn to read. So some of these professional questions, uh, which uh, are, are ones that we're absolutely concerned about, and I think that the way that you develop good policy about what goes on in the classroom is by doing what Tristan said uh, that he wants to do and what he has been doing, which is to talk to teachers' unions and talk to the profession, because that way we won't get uh, an, an obsession that sy systematic synthetic phonics is the only way to teach reading. I'm not saying that it doesn't help enormously with some children. But it equally, for some children, it's not the way to do it at all. So we absolutely need the Labour Party uh, to make sure that they engage with us. So there are many things where we've got an absolute, absolute coincidence of interest uh, with the kinds of policies that the Labour Party is putting forward. From our point of view, I think the jury is a bit out about the director of school standards. You know, we, I mean, our, our impression is that what you'd be well off having is a director of education or what we might, what we used to fondly call a chief education officer <laughs> in every local authority. And we do think that this kind of notion of recreating a middle tier or a different tier, when you've actually got local government, and I, you know, I know it's very, you know, I live in Hammersmith and Fulham. Uh, for eight years, it was, a, it was a rabid Tory authority and they frankly did terrible things. And it wasn't, I might say, on the Labour Party's target list for winning. But actually, because we ran a campaign, the National Union of Teachers ran a campaign to keep open a hugely successful working class primary school, one of the most improved primary schools in the country. Uh, because we, won, we ran a campaign to keep that school open, because we worked with parents and said, you have an absolute right to keep this school, a school that has a meadow in it, uh, which is right next to quite a lot of tower blocks where children have no gardens, but they come to Sullivan School and they have places to play and grow flowers and so on. And actually, because we worked with the community, the, the upshot of that was that actually, I think it was that, there's also some work that we done on the hospital campaign and some other planning issues, but most of the that council changed hands because what they could see was that actually their council wasn't wanting to help and support them. Mm. But of course, you know, so of course, you know, if we hadn't had the election at the right time, the local authority would have done the wrong thing. But it was a very good piece of political activity, not aimed at changing the council, but aimed at supporting the community locally. Um, so it's really important to us that the community is involved in schools and that they actually 
have a voice for being able to say these are the kinds of things that we want to do. Now, you, know, you can't have complete chaos, obviously you do need to have some kind of system, but we really do need, we, we really do need to be engaging with communities in schools. So that's why uh, we are absolutely prepared to agree that, that, that school must be the hub of the community. And finally, um, it's no good governments just saying, we've got the best generation of teachers we've ever had. They actually have to say, we want to trust teachers and we want to make teaching a sufficiently attractive job to bring people in. It does mean that we have to be able to work with other services. I agree with Tristram, we have to, we have to rebuild the, uh, the career service, we have to be able to work with, the, work with the play service. We have to rebuild what we used to have at local authority level of all of those additional services, in particular with children, for children with special educational needs, because just giving individual schools a bit of money so that they can buy in someone to help with a child who may have hearing loss or may have uh, autistic spectrum difficulties or whatever, doesn't work. You need a coherent approach to that, which runs across and through and within uh, the society. So, you know, we are very much hoping that our Stand Up for Education manifesto will get very wide coverage, that people will talk about it, they'll want to talk about it with local politicians, but also that our members will want to talk about it with parents and, and governors and teachers and young people themselves to say that we genuinely believe that there is a better way to run the education service. And underlying that is that we believe there's also a better way to run society which is fairer, which is more transparent, and which is genuinely concerned to make sure that every single person is able to fulfil the maximum that they possibly can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christine. Um, before we sort of throw things open to the floor, um, we do have a couple of items here. Uh, the first is that I'd like to call on Derek Tatton, who is um, from the Raymond Williams Foundation, uh, to make a brief contribution. Derek. Um, there's a mic for you there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't realise when nobody asked it. Say this, I, I would just like to draw the attention of uh, everybody here to a leaflet that's out in the foyer about the Raymond Williams uh, Foundation, uh, which is an, a charity uh, dedicated to assisting adults uh, gain uh, further education uh, throughout their whole life. And um, uh, <coughs> that leaflet essentially uh, tells you everything you might need to know about the Raymond Williams Foundation. So I might like to use this opportunity to actually put a question to Christian uh, uh, because um, it's related, in fact, to the Raymond Williams Foundation. Raymond Williams, incidentally, for, uh, don't feel guilty if you don't recognise the name. Uh, he was a writer. Uh, he died 25 years ago, but his books still live on, and indeed he is widely respected across the continents of the world. Fifty articles have been written in Mandarin Chinese about Raymond Williams in the last 10 years, for example. Um, so he is an interesting uh, writer who will, whose views will endure. He was a strong socialist, incidentally. Um, but my question now, the National Institute of Adult and Continuing Education has issued a general election manifesto. And part four of that manifesto says, quote, more, there should be more emphasis on informal, non-formal, as well as formal learning. And I want to make a comment on that, and my question follows through on what's happened to adult education in this country and the NIA's proposal, I've just quoted. Adult education in North Staffordshire was exceptionally strong, as Tristan has referred to this briefly in his, uh, in his speech. Tawny taught his first uh, class in Longton in 1909. And following that, um, adult education in North Staffordshire and the Potteries uh, was uh, remarkably robust and innovative. 
For example, just behind where our speakers are sitting, there's still a building, but before uh, its current use, it was called Cartwright House. And Cartwright House was an adult education centre for the run with the WEA, but uh, providing an extraordinary wide range of activities for at least 40 years uh, in Stoke-on-Trent. But crucially, that centre was linked to a network of other city centres, adult education, feeding through to the Wedgwood Memorial College in Barlaston, where, as a residential college, skills and training were taught, but along with education for its own sake, education for social purpose, trade union education, and indeed pension courses. Um, most of that adult education has now gone, of course. And I think we should acknowledge that it has gone, and that's a loss. Um, however, all's not lost, because there are continuities, and Tristan referred to the WEA in this area continuing. Uh, but informal learning, especially in this region, is quite lively. The U3A, book groups, philosophy in pubs, Sally bars, Stoke skeptics in pubs, arts and literary festivals, pensioner convention lectures, and so on and so on. All of that is important education. So the general question I wish to put is, how can this informal learning be best supported and connected again to adult education? And specifically a question, more for Tristan, this one particularly, may be, the Wedgwood Memorial College, which closed two years ago, remains empty, with no sign of sale, it's costing city taxpayers £150,000 a year just to keep the building warm and uh, secure. Um, if Stoke on Trent City Council agreed now to reopen a suitably modified and adapted college, couldn't that be a really positive springboard next year to integrate the informal with the formal learning in North Staffordshire? connecting back to that great tradition of adult education. Derek, thank you for that. It's a very, very, um, very powerful speech. And I, I taught, um, I didn't teach, I, I, I took a couple of, I gave a couple of lectures at the, the Wedgwood College and, uh, before, um, before it closed. Um, and this also gives me the opportunity to, to pay tribute to, to the work of Claire White uh, at, at the WEA um, in Bursley, which I think is enormously important. Look, it would be, it, it would be great um, to have the college reopened, and we you know, fought on this uh, some, some years ago. Um, and as it were, what we always predicted, which is that you'd end up spending more money on sort of gates and security guards to, to keep it as a viable, sale option relative to keeping it open for for learning um you know was there um you know as, as you remember and people in this room will remember what fell down was you know looking for contributions from staffs as, as well as stoke on trent and the, the raw fact of the matter was as it were the number of users from stoke on trent relative to staffordshire and around the country uh, and, and the battle we had over that. Nonetheless, I always regard it as a really big asset for North Staffordshire, which brought people into the city uh, and, and celebrated our, our, our history, and literary identity and heritage. Um, so in, in the absence of that, you're absolutely right about the, the informal learning and the non-formal learning and everything that's going on here. We had a very, very successful inaugural Stoke Literary Festival uh, this year. We're going to try and do it again next year, but really build on the local networks and make sure we're plugged into the reading groups and the library groups um, as well as the local authors. Christine, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know that teachers go free to the Stoke Literary Festival. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a key part of it. I would also say, you know, linking up to some of the activities through Union Learn uh, and what's going on at, um, at Stoke College and, uh, and, and the work there is important. I think in the absence of, uh, of, of, of decent institutional resources and, and funding, we have to keep the, the informal learning systems going as much as possible um, and hope we find an institutional basis for it in the near future. I just want to say really briefly, I'm, I'm very glad that Tristan mentioned it because 
it was it was very great credit to the previous Labour government that they created Union Learn, and um, a, a lot of a lot of people have managed to access courses through Union Learn facilities that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. I, uh, let me just say that I, you know, I apologise to no one about saying that actually in schools, in classrooms, every child in every lesson deserves a qualified teacher. That doesn't mean to say that I don't think that children and young people uh, learn an enormous amount of things in other places. And, you know, it's, it, it's terrible that there are places around the country where you have to pay to get into a museum because... You know, it, it just shouldn't be the case that any child is deprived of the opportunity of going to a museum because it costs them money to go to that or a, or a gallery or whatever. And uh, in the National Union of Teachers, we are primarily concerned with the formal learning in schools, but we are also we also recognise that all of those other things are really important. And I have to say that uh, I uh, I look forward. To I look forward with some dread, I must say, to retirement on the basis that by the time I retire there might be absolutely nothing left for retired people to do. But I am earnestly hoping that my retirement plan of learning to play the saxophone as well as learning another modern foreign language will still come to pass and that I will be able to spend some time learning and discussing philosophy in pubs. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I have a written question now which has been submitted. And this uh, is from Dawn Shepherd, who is Chair of Governors at Holden Lane Primary School. And her question is, what is the Labour Party vision of the pupil premium? Will it still exist, or be postcoded, or will it be means tested? Um, I mean, the, the pupil premium um, built upon a, a policy Labour had in office. We regard it as, as, as part of the the fabric now. In many situations it's, it's, it's made up for withdrawn funding in other areas but it's just sort of codified as pupil premium. The, the, the philosophy behind it is enormously important that, that, that you, you are directing funds uh, to make sure that children from disadvantaged backgrounds are succeeding um, and I've seen it used brilliantly in so many schools um, in Stoke-on-Trent. I think, I think there's a there's an interesting argument, well, it's not an argument, there's an interesting debate to be had at what age and at what value, at what age it should be, uh, and whether it should be, um, at, what at what level it could be used more effectively in the early years. There have been some poor examples uh, of use of the pupil premium, you know, refitting bike sheds and other things, you know, this is not what it's there for. Uh, and what we need to make sure also is that school leaders and uh, teachers are up to date with, with the best research and the best evidence as to where it's used most effectively. Um, so we, we will continue with pupil premium, but we, we want to make absolutely sure it's being used most effectively uh, and that school leaders are up to date with the, with the best evidence uh, on how it can be used most effectively. Well, I think Tristram is absolutely right that one of the problems is that because there have been so many cuts to central services, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the precise arrangements here, but in lots of parts of the country, the kind of services that used to be provided centrally by local authorities, partly because academies took out their share and therefore you lost the economies of scale, partly because there were other sorts of local authority cuts coming in. Uh, the, the, the pupil premium was really the lifesaver in some cases to fill the, fill the gap and make sure that those services which had been lost could be replaced. Now that really wasn't the intention. The intention was that young people who deserved a boost would be able to get it through the pupil premium. So, I mean, certainly in the National Union of Teachers, our view is that all schools need to be funded according to need. And, uh, and that, but that they also need to have access to services uh, beyond. So I'm pleased that there's no intention to withdraw the pupil premium in the sense that anything that talk, talks about taking away funding I think is now a problem. But I think we, we do need to have the discussion about how much and at what level and, and what else are we going to build back into the system so that every child and young person really does have all of the facilities that they need. Um, thank you, Christine. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the floor now. So please feel free to ask a question or make a contribution 
All I ask is that you keep your comments, please, because we've only got a limited amount of time, and I'm sure that a lot of people uh, want to get up and say something. Uh, what I'll do, perhaps, is take three contributions and then ask Trisha and Christine to, to comment. Um, Steve at the back's got the roving mic, so we'll bring the mic to you. Uh, we have a question at the, right at the front, down here. Libby Temple, I'm a teacher at a secondary academy. Um, I think one of the reasons that we can't really do it now is because in the 1990s when I became a teacher, I was actually a teacher. I taught in the classroom and I knew my subject area. Now I'm considered to be a social worker. I have to manage money. I have to, I'm sure loads of things like this used to happen before, but now the emphasis is so much on the other things outside of my curriculum area that I cannot no longer focus so much on what I'm teaching. Um, and not only that, um, when Ofsted come in, if I cannot identify the pupil premium child in the corner, and I don't know that they're pupil premium, I've got 363 children that I teach every single week. I have to teach 25 lessons, I have to mark 363 books, and we have a very strict policy. I have to mark in green pen, red pen, all sorts of things. I write more than the children do. And if I don't, I'm scrutinized and I'm vilified. I'm also vilified by Mr. Gove, thankfully he's gone, and the parents hate teachers. I want to know what the Labour Party is going to do to raise self-esteem of the teachers, to put them on the pedestal that they were. I'm not a babysitter, I'm actually a qualified teacher, um, and I want parents to respect me like they did in the 1990s. Um, so hopefully the Labour Party will address that issue. Um, Stephen, I'm Trevor Fisher, and I'd like to follow up what that uh, colleague has just said in a moment. But before I want to actually follow up what she said, which is absolutely crucial, I would like to make a point about uh, what's been said about London Challenge. Um, I'm a former pupil, uh, student of uh, Tim Brickhouse who's at Keele University. And um, while London Challenge is universally accepted as being a fantastic success, six months ago on question time to 10 million viewers, Matthew Hancock, Conservative Party Minister, said, it's a wonderful success, London Challenge, run by Andrew Adonis. <laughs> now, everybody who uh, knows London Challenge knows it's run by Tim Brickhouse. I think it's vitally important we mentioned London Challenge because it was a great success. We pointed out it was Professor Brickhouse who actually said that. I was so annoyed about that. I wrote to the BBC and they sent me the DVD of the programme. So I now have DVD I can actually play showing Matthew Hancock telling a place to lie. Uh, well, you might not know that because he made it so ignorant. Doesn't know. Anyway, Colin just actually picked up the most important thing that's happening about education. 40% of our teachers leave in the first five years. According to the OECD, we've got the, with South Korea, we have the youngest teaching force on the planet. The reason why it's very simple, and the colleague has just said it, they're burning out our teachers. Yeah. And the biggest issue that the concerned people are saying, yes, we all know this, is know what teachers are. One of my colleagues I worked with for 15 years uh, quit her job at the end of last term, head of English at a local college. She just had had enough. So the real question is, what are the unions and Labour going to do about our teacher burnout? Um, thank you, Christine. Like to come in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I agree with some uh, some of what John had to say. I have to say that uh, we in the National Union, teachers are not terribly keen on the eleven plus. We actually think that what's important is that you have a comprehensive school where you can take all colours and where you can have the best possible education for everyone. What we do absolutely agree with you about is that there should be a good local school for every child, preferably to which they can walk, certainly to which they can get on a, on a very short bus ride, and that the school should be linked in uh, to the communities. And it, it, it's my view that, uh, that the Labour Party could 
uh, win a lot of plaudits from both teachers, of whom I understand there are about a thousand in every constituency, and parents by saying that is what our aspiration is. We we aspire to a good local school for every child. And if I tell you, if I tell you that these are the four recommendations that we've got in our in our manifesto. End approvals of free schools and give all schools the right to return to the status of local community schools. Stop the forced academisation uh, programme immediately. Return oversight of all state funded schools to local authorities whilst maintaining, so this is at government level, uh, appropriate levels of autonomy on the curriculum and assessment. Because obviously, it, you know, we want to have the proper level, we want to have appropriate levels of autonomy at school, but obviously we think it's important that government should have some oversight. And that each local council should have a director of education, which I mentioned earlier in my remarks, to assure consistency and equality and indeed a good local school for every child. And can I just say that I, I think I, I've no idea whether it's indeed Nikki Morgan to anybody at all, but she did she did write a letter apparently to all teachers who are in service this week, telling them, uh, thanking them for the hard work that they've done uh, in order to put in place the government's reforms. Well, I have to tell you that I don't think there's anyone who thinks that they've been working in school in order to put in place the government reforms. Some of them have been working their socks off in order to, uh, in order to avoid the worst excesses of the things uh, that government is doing. And of course the other thing that she did was to say, um, we think it would be a really good idea to have mandatory setting in all schools uh, and that maybe Ofsted, maybe this could be policed by saying that Ofsted would say that a school could only be outstanding if it had setting. Now, I can tell you that all of the international evidence collected by the OECD shows that actually it militates against the success of middle achievers and low achievers if you set them in a rigid system. You can have, you know, odd bits of, uh, of different types of grouping, but essentially, setting is is the least uh, is likely to lead to the lowest quality across the board and the least equality across the board so having you know going back to the idea of a grammar school and a secondary modern school you know we absolutely don't think that's the right thing to do comprehensive schools are the unsung huge huge success and of course isn't it funny that more schools went comprehensive under margaret thatcher than under uh, any other leader of the country or secretary of state before or since. Um, uh, the, the colleagues who talked about what life is like in the classroom, um, I, you know, I, could, I could have come along and, and focused my attention much more on the fact that for, for some teachers, it's absolutely true that they are completely ground down by the Ofsted uh, arrangements, by the amount of hours that they're having to do that are not, that are not helpful. And, uh, and I think I did mention that in passing. I also agree that teachers are not social workers. There was a funny old idea uh, from this government at one point that, that these should be, uh, that the people should be spending some time being a teacher and some time being a social worker. These are, these are different jobs, they're different careers. A teacher is not a social worker. It's not to say that teachers don't care about what happens with children. Of course they do, but we shouldn't. We shouldn't have the ills of society visited in schools, which is why, when I started my remarks, I said, I think it's really important uh, for the Labour Party to be talking about social justice and to be talking about you know, economic policy and all of those things which do have an impact in schools. Uh, you know, it's not to say that there aren't things that we should do as well, but essentially we can't, we can't be doing the job of other people. And, um, I'm not sure, I, I taught from 1973 till really quite, till about 10 years ago. I didn't want to be on a pedestal, but I do think it's important that there's a sense of mutual respect between both teachers and students, teachers and parents, parents and their children and so on. I, I think that's absolutely important and I think that you, I think that one of the things that's gone badly wrong with this government is that they have allowed Ofsted, it would have been really nice if the incoming Labour government had abolished it, they didn't. Uh, it would be really nice if they said that they would now. But one of the things that this government has done is allow Michael Wilshaw pretty much free reign to do what he likes. And if, if Nicky Morgan is really intending to say that schools can't be excellent uh, if, if Ofsted says that they're not doing setting properly, then that will make things much worse. Um, you can send me, if you like, uh, Trevor, a copy of that um, 
the, the video of the programme. I mean, I, I'm, it, I'm, I'm prepared to believe that it wasn't that Matthew Hancock lied through his teeth, it's just that he didn't know what he was talking about. Because the Tories are very keen to talk about Andrew Adonis, who was, of course, the architect of the Academy's programme. And I'm very pleased that Tristram has not stood on this platform and said, well, our Academy's were all right, but theirs aren't. Because actually, we don't really think that, do we? We think that it was, it was not the right... You know, it was well-intentioned under the Labour Party, but it was not the right not policy. Right. And it's absolutely yeah. not the right policy now, because it's going in completely the wrong direction. I mean, Michael, the first thing Michael Gove did was to say, all schools that are outstanding can become academies. How did they become academies? They came, became academies by being community schools, by being part of their local family schools and being in local authorities. So, uh, so we do have to do more about teacher burnout. We are having discussions with this government. Uh, we're pressing them very hard. We've got uh, both ourselves and the NESUWT have policy that if, uh, if things are really excessive in schools, we will, we will take industrial action about it. We don't want to do that, we want to improve things by negotiation. But we will uh, if, if people's lives are being made in misery. And it's absolutely true that Ofsted itself says that two in five, only two in five teachers who start are there at the end of, of five years. That, that cannot possibly be a, a way to run an, an education service. And so it was quite interesting at the end of, uh, of the summer that we'd been making a big, a very big deal about how many hours teachers were working. There were a number of reports that came out at the end and so on. And suddenly, you had a flurry of politicians from all parties saying, oh, this can't be right. We can't possibly have teachers doing all these hours. Uh, because this is, it is a very, very long hours culture. And it's, a, you know, it's, it's not a culture that operates to make sure that teachers can, uh, can be as successful as they can. So, uh, both at individual school level but also at national level, the unions are all working to make sure that we really do improve both the, the workload for teachers but also the general circumstances in which they work. And I, I mean, you know, one of the things that we do in the National Union of Teachers is that we, we, uh, we survey um, parents. We don't do it, we ask YouGov to do it. So, um, one of the things that, they, that, that parents said was that 82% of them said that absolutely schools should have qualified teachers. Now, when you think about the fact that, that, that you don't <coughs> get much over 80 in anything these days, that's very good. They also, uh, over 80 people, over 80% thought that, that local authorities should be the people, it should, be the lo should have the local stroke in new schools. Um, only 3% trusted the education secretary uh, at, the, at the time it was Michael Gove. Maybe it would be different if it were Tristan. But only 3% trusted the education secretary to make decisions about their children's education because actually they thought they should be made locally, both in terms of the local authority and in terms of the school. So I think there are some interesting messages there. I'll aim for 6%. <laughs> um, Briefly, so we can um, hear more colleagues. Um, the, the issue on teacher uh, burnout, I mean, it's a, it's a massive waste of money, resources, and talent. And I think when, when, when we look at teachers, you know, you're always going to get um, a certain number of teachers who begin a teacher training course and then not complete it. It's not for them. When they sort of face the classroom, they realise this is not where they want to be, um, and some of the good elements of School Direct are to make sure uh, that, that, that there is that, that practice-based element. I think when I, when I talk to, to new teachers and you talk to academics about this, the, the amount which is thrown at newly qualified teachers um, is, is sometimes almost the same which is hitting teachers who've been there five, seven, ten years. And then the, I think there's an issue about the, the, the amount which is expected of newly qualified teachers relative to other professions in terms of the, the entry. So how can we get a, a, a career structure uh, and, a, and, and a teaching structure which allows a, a, a sort of a gentler entry uh, into, the, um, into the profession? There's a, there are a lot of conversations going on at the moment about teacher training. We agree very much with what Christine said about the role of higher education institutions. You know, Keel, we've produced lots of great uh, teachers out of Keel, and one of, the, one of the merits of that was also 
people coming from across the UK, going to Kiel and then teaching in Stoke schools. So actually we, we got you know the, the mix and the churn uh, of people coming to North Staffordshire because of Kiel. We, we want to see higher education institutions involved in teacher training and not simply uh, have just uh, some of the limits we, we also see with school directors. Um, I absolutely agree that, that um, uh, you know, teachers should not be uh, social workers, we, we have to be, and this is where I agree with Michael Wilshaw, he's very strong about the roles and responsibilities of parents um, and the roles and duties of parents um, and the, the, the functions of a family. The, the challenge, also to point to Christine's point, is, is where you have dysfunctional families, where you have such levels of poverty and, and chaotic background, actually school is a structure and because you are professionals and because you care for the learning outcomes uh, of those involved, you, you do get involved. What, what we need to make sure, and I think we, you know, we haven't really touched on teaching assistants uh, this evening, is to make sure that those more broadly involved in, in, in the school system, those in the school support staff network, have the training and the roles and the functions, which allows you as a teacher to focus on your prime responsibility uh, in terms of, uh, of teaching. I think where it becomes challenging and, and where the, the, the debate is, we also want teachers, because of their stature and status and sort of attractiveness to students, to be involved in those extracurricular activities, which I've you know, seen for myself at St Peter's um, and elsewhere. And, you know, I think the challenge we're going to face in government is if we want more of these extracurricular activities and non-formal learning, which um, is so important in school, whether it's drama or art or music or sports, and we want teachers to be involved with that, how do we also make sure we're not overloading them uh, and they continue to focus on their primary uh, curriculum responsibilities? Um, John, I, I mean, uh, I am proud of um, the Labour Party sponsored academy. Uh, program. Um, I think there were certain situations uh, where you had very underperforming um, uh, schools, often in a monopoly um, status, uh, and actually you had sponsored academies come in with an ethos and a vision and a determination which really reformed the life chances of young people in high poverty um, areas who had been let down. Uh, by pre-existing systems um, and if the Labour Party is about anything it's about making sure that we're delivering aspiration and ambition uh, for children from very disadvantaged backgrounds and many academies did that and many academies do that in, uh, in Stoke-on-Trent today but we've swung too far uh, the other way and education policy you know, moves in these uh, uh, directions what what Gove did was just throw everything up into the air with his converter academy program so everyone became an academy without the direction or the focus or the ethos. Uh, and now we have a far too atomised system and our, and our responsibility in office is to rebuild elements of that local oversight and accountability and place planning and also, you know, understand that when schools partner and collaborate and challenge one another in an arena and ethos uh, of trust and professionalism, you raise results. Um, autonomy is important, um, and that's what the Sponsored Academy uh, programme was about. But autonomy only really succeeds when it's in a um, relationship, when schools are in a relationship with other schools. And weirdly, under the Academy programme at the moment, which has lost its way, um, you've got lots of Academy chains um, who are not responsible and responsive to local communities and who are very restricted about the freedoms um, um, that schools are allowed to, um, uh, to practice. Um, I won't name names, but I'm still waiting three months on to response to a second letter to the Chair of Trustees uh, and the Director of the Academy chain uh, here in Stoke-on-Trent about a local issue. Um, and if they're not responding to members of Parliament raising issues on behalf of their constituents, uh, that doesn't seem to me uh, a very proper relationship with their communities. Thank you. We have three more contributions. We've got a uh, gentleman over here. Get the mic. Duncan Han March, Staffordshire University, Education Lecturer. Um, I think one of the successes of Labour that you didn't really mention uh, were its moves towards professionalising the FE workforce. 
Um, even uh, a government report from the new government uh, by private consultants found that this was a great success in terms of boosting morale of the teachers. Um, their managers thought they were performing better. Uh, businesses that they worked with and the learners all thought that these reforms were actually, although still in progress, were actually working well. In 2011, the government deregulated uh, the FE workforce, so teachers in FE no longer require qualifications. It's all down to the discretion of the provider. Um, given that you're very keen to um, ensure that teachers in schools are qualified, will this also extend to teachers in FE colleges as well? Thanks. Okay, I, I've got the very blonde hair in the middle of the row there. I'm Jennifer Pardew and I'm not speaking for, but I'm a member of the Staffordshire Area Network for Disabilities. I'm concerned if children are being expected to start at eight and finish at six. But first of all, it's very dark at some of those times, at some parts of the year. But in terms of disability, what about the young carers who have got duties at home to get mum or dad up? and see that they're safe for the day, got some sandwiches, and they've got to dash home to go home and change their water bottles or whatever. Thank you, and um, the gentleman right at the back with the yellow. I'm Alan Burrett, I'm a professional storyteller, um, writer, actor, and poet. I work in schools or in workshops in, in all the disciplines of literacy. Uh, I was interested in, in Tristan's point there that you're gonna try and um, but uh, force, basically, young people to do maths and English up to the age of 18. I'm a grandparent now. Getting my 13-year-old granddaughter to come in on time uh, is uh, when, she, when I'm looking at She does it for parents, but not for me. I'm too soft. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, how are you going to force them to stay on in their education to 17 and 18 just for specifically maths and English? Maths in particular, a subject that many, many people loathe. I loved it, my son hated it. And just one final point there, if the House of Commons was to be austerity, well, I think we'd bloody close it. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're going for requires improvements rather than uh, the full uh, category. Um, uh, Alan, I think on, we, we're now going to have a rising participation age until 18. So young people will legally have to be in education or training uh, to the age of 18. Um, and that's, that's only right. Um, as part of their training um, or education, we think they maths and English should be a part of that. Because, um, and it's not about them redoing their GCSEs over and over again. This is about functional, um, practical learning, which is gonna help them get jobs um, and get better incomes and get better jobs in the future. We're very, very poor on this. And that's why those young people um, who only get, um, who, who, who fail a level two, who fail the GCSE, their educational prospects are markedly limited and their chances of getting it later are really limited. Um, and so, I mean, we'll, you know, England is the, is the outrider on this. Compared to uh, um, our, our continental uh, partners, uh, they are demanding this um, to the age of 18. Um, and so you're, you're right, we've got to get it right. It can't, you, you know, it has to be something that people see the use of, we're also going to have a challenge in making sure we've got the, uh, the teachers and lecturers to, to deliver it, but in the long run, in terms of the employment prospects, so they don't have so many you know, young people that need the not in employment, education or training, it's an important tool. Um, and, and, but, but you're right, Adam, we, we, have to make it, uh, we have to make it work, we have to make it seem uh, um, appropriately. Um, Joan, on, on, on disability, the, the, um, we're not saying uh, young people will need to be at school 8 a.m. Uh, to 6 p.m. We're saying that the school should be open. So if uh, uh, parents want to drop their, their kids off there, or if they want them uh, to stay an extra hour afterwards in some 
club or facility, uh, then, then that should be available. That wouldn't be the formal learning part, it's just that the school as a facility, as a site, uh, could be open uh, if people uh, want to use it. Just as now, the breakfast clubs in, um, in, in many schools, which some parents um, and young people make use of and others don't, and that's absolutely fine. What we want to make sure is that the option is there uh, for them to take that. It, it certainly wouldn't be um, um, uh, obligatory. Um, Duncan, on, 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 on the further education um, workforce, you're absolutely right that that is our, um, our direction, where we want to head. It, it becomes, I think, slightly more complicated um, in, in some parts um, of FE. Uh, because of the, you know, what is being taught and the nature of what is being taught and uh, the, uh, the, the, much of the practical application of, of what's being delivered there. We would expect all of those delivering uh, courses within FE to, um, uh, to become qualified teachers. They're teaching young people. Um, they will learn how to be better teachers as qualified teachers. They will... Um, um, be, be more effective in their jobs, um, that's absolutely, um, and, and particularly if they're going to be teaching 14, 15 year olds now as, as, as further education colleges uh, are allowed. So that is absolutely, as we politicians <coughs> terribly say, our direction of travel. Uh, but there are, th there are some sort of specificities about the FE model which make it less clear cut, uh, but we think it is valuable and effective and useful. Um, and. Uh, we would expect it to be without the necessarily same degree of mandatoriness. And I don't think that's a word, mandatoriness. Or without the same, <laughs> the same level of yeah. punishment. <laughs> Can I, I just, just briefly, I mean, uh, to reinforce uh, what Tristan said, the, the idea that the school is the hub of the community, it's a building that should be used in a multiplicity of ways, the National Union Teacher supports that. But I, I agree with Tristan absolutely. We're not talking about. Uh, children sitting in classes and being taught from 8 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the evening. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about it for several reasons. One is it's a ridiculously long day and children, even children who haven't got other types of responsibilities would be ludicrously tired. And I don't want teachers to be doing it. I don't think that's the right thing for them to be doing. But I do think it's reasonable that if we have uh, a building that has resources, that it's, that it's okay for other things to be going on there between you know, eight and nine, and then, you know, half past three and six. Um, I, I think the jury's out about this whole maths and English to 18 question. Um, the, the thing is, there, there are fabulously interesting things that you can be doing post-GCSE, which are not, you know, start embarking on A-level English or maths, and they are other really interesting things. The question is how permissive the curriculum 16 to you know going on 19 will be how many, how much resource that we'll be able to do it and how many teachers we will have to make sure that we can do it i mean you know those of you who know teachers or are teachers or talk to people about the way english is going in schools at the moment we're we're very concerned in the national union of teachers about you know the the dead hand of of the curriculum the fact that children don't actually read whole books. I think I think that once they get to, I think they should be doing it all through, but certainly once they get to 16, to be able to just read a whole lot of really interesting books and then, yeah, do some work on them if necessary. I mean, you know, did you notice that uh, before his demise, Michael Gove started to say, we don't really think that children in this country should be reading um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, one of the most successfully taught books at GCSE because it's full of social justice and it's really interesting. Now, it would be a thing that, that might very well be a book that post-16s would want to read and discuss. And, you know, we would want to link what they're doing post-16, if they are going to be doing English and maths, with a whole lot of other life skills and other kinds of soft skills. We would want to be promoting, you know, what in the jargon is called oracy or what we call speaking and listening as part of keeping both uh, English and maths on the curriculum. But we do have to resource it. We do have to make sure there's a proper dialogue about what the content of that is. And it can't just be yet another test, yet another set of hoops that the kids and the teachers have to jump through. And, and I think, uh, let me just say, I think that, that everybody who is teaching people 
should go through a process of learning how it is that you teach. Yes. So I, I do think that there should be qualified teacher status for everyone who's doing teaching. Thank you. Um, we need to finish in about 10 minutes or so because Christine and Tristram do have to get trains back to London. So can you make your remarks uh, very brief, please? I've got a gentleman over there. Thank you, Jason. My name is John Beach, former Labour Party member. Uh, one of the big questions and um, one of the issues, why has Labour Party jumped into bed with academies when they were staunchly opposed to that maintained school? There is virtually no difference just to change your name. The, the main yeah. major issue I want to raise is there has been no major education review since 1858, 156 years ago. We've had two major acts, the 44 Act and the 88 Act. The 44, there was consultation for three to four years on the Green Paper. <coughs> there was less than 12 months consultation from the Green Paper in 87 to the implementation in 88. And there has still not been a review, a comprehensive review of education from the cradle to the grave. When is the Labour Party going to embark on a comprehensive review? Thank you, we've got, I think it's Claire, is it in the um, middle there, near the back? about how valuable it is when communities um, can work with schools um, and it's really inconsistent in the city um, <coughs> and some schools that are amazing um, embedded in the community and um, are sort of inviting the community in and they're, they're connected to libraries and everything and others that are more like fortresses um, and feel like that especially to people who have bad experiences of education in the past. Um, I was just wondering and, and, and a lot of them have got to privatise aspects as well so um, room hire is being is, is very very expensive for the local community. Um, I just wondered if you would be building in any obligations or, um, for all state funded schools um, to be able to kind of invite in the community and maybe resource community development so that they can um, contribute to local needs and, and for example get more um, old people in, older people into schools. Um, so it's not just parents but people who might experience social isolation could come and contribute to this sort of X to X offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just there. Uh, yeah. Hello, my name is Linda Marks. I'm the member of the North South Adventures Convention. Um, I thought, I'd just like to reiterate the, the need for maths and English to be taught all the way through um, school years. My granddaughter, uh, youngest granddaughter, <coughs> in her last year at school, experienced um, a, a real horrific area in maths. She had two maths teachers during that year, both with different teaching styles. Consequently, that she didn't achieve what she needed to achieve in her exams when she came to leave the school. And I also believe, you know, there's too many teachers that focus on the very clever children of the school that can, that, that, that can um, rise to very big, figures on education, rather than the, the children that are not clever enough and can't get their head around what maths is all about. Maths is very good, but it needs teaching in a specific way to specific children. And although I know you can't do a one-to-one, -one, the, the most emphasis must be on the children that are struggling in that area, rather than the children who are the cleverest ones that are going to come out with higher, higher grades. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I think we can just uh, take one more. Yes, right to the front here. Uh, my name's Jackie Barfoot. I'm from the People's Assembly and also uh, a supporter of disabled people against cops. My question is the, to Tristram. Um, if uh, education is going to be extended to 18-year-olds, on mandate for maths and English, how is the system going to cope with disabled uh, teenagers with mental health problems, Asperger's, dyscalculia and dyslexia, because there isn't the amount of proper trained teachers in learning disabilities and mental health to cope with that situation? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask 
Christine to respond first and to sum up, because um, we have to finish shortly and then ask questions. So Christine. Okay, let me just say that I think that I think that I I covered in my remarks earlier the fact that there there is an issue about English and Maths to 18. We've got to make sure we've got the resources, we've got the staff, we've got the curriculum to make it worthwhile and uh, and meaningful. Um, I'll focus a little bit on Claire's question. Uh, I, I think that for the most part, schools do want to work with communities, but schools, and you heard this from a couple of the contributors earlier, are under, are under ludicrous amounts of pressure. Yeah. They're under ludicrous amounts of pressure from Ofsted, and they're under ludicrous <coughs> amounts of pressure from league tables. And the upshot of that is that they do all of the things that are measured, you know, they're measured in terms of, you know, whether kids are going up a level or, or getting a GCSE or whatever, and they find less time than they would want to find for doing these other things. So I, I think that we have to find a different way of schools both linking with their communities and being accountable. <clears throat> and we have to say that what we're interested in is developing well-rounded young people rather than just schools being exam factories. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, that Anthony Selden, who runs whatever school it is, the Western Wellington. Sydney, Wellington, Wellington College, you know, he's, he's working with the most privileged sections of society. And he is saying to us, you know, it's wrong that schools are exam factories. Well, it's very easy if you come from the most privileged section of society to be able to say that. But I'm still pleased that he says it. But it, it is true that we need to have a better approach to education, which is more, dare I say it, child and pupil centred, it's more about what everyone needs to learn than it is just about, you know, getting, passing this, getting over this hoop. And, and if we did that, then schools would have more scope and time to engage with their communities. So on the question of room hire, you know, PFI was the death knell of schools being the hub of their communities. In some cases, schools can't even afford themselves to hire their rooms because of the way they're ludicrously tied into PFI deals. I mean, you know, if there was ever a question of forgiving debt, then it seems to me forgiving PFI debt would be a, a very good thing to do. And finally, just I, I, I think that the notion that schools should should be the place where there is intergenerational solidarity is absolutely critical because we know that there are plenty of parents who don't have the advantage of seeing their grandparents, sorry, children who don't see their grandparents often enough, and some older folk who don't perhaps see their their grandchildren often enough. I think it's a really good and important thing for schools to be doing. But we have to have a system that says we want schools to be doing all of these things. We have to therefore stop doing some of the things that we're doing and we have to not have the uh, the oppression uh, of, of, of Ofsted bearing down on people. And uh, so, yeah, we will make sure that, uh, that we are paying attention to all of our all of the children that we have bring into school whether they have disabilities or no disabilities and that they really are given the best opportunities um, the first thing to say is just you know how much wonderful stuff is going on in schools uh, across the city um, and if I think of the um, the engineering club um, the building of the, the car competition between the Carp Academy and Birch's Head and elsewhere, sponsored by Care this wonderful example uh, of uh, young kids getting together, working out in their engineering clubs, how you build this car, you know, real teamwork, skills, practical work, it's absolutely brilliant. If I think of some of the, the drama and music uh, I've seen in schools across the city, if I think of the, uh, the reading clubs, if I think of the, the, the politics society, our sixth form, you know, we're rightly addressing the public policy um, issues, uh, but with respect to John, we should also think that young people today are doing tremendously well and are having a, an exciting uh, time in many of their schools, and they're being inspired by wonderful teachers and, and great head teachers, and we should, be, uh, we should be confident about that. And this is a conversation about how we make it better and how we make it uh, much better um, for the future. Um, John, the, the, the comprehensive review of um, education. I think there's, there's a, I mean, I know what you mean, but having, having actually read, I spent the summer reading the history of the 1944 Butler Act, and, and you're right that it goes back years in terms of the research, but actually 
it was an incredibly narrow uh, area in, in terms of, the, as it were, who was involved in the discussion leading up to that legislation. At times, it seemed to be a sort of three bishops, four civil servants, and um, um, and um, Churchill and Butler. Um, but not many uh, women. No women, as far as I can tell. Although a woman implemented it, Evan Wilkinson uh, yeah. had to had to deliver uh, the legislation. Um, I think that what's really interesting at the moment is the amount of research which is out there. It's it's. The more education is talked about in fora uh, such as this, uh, the better it is. And we've got some really fascinating research, you know, whether it's the pupil premium, uh, whether it's the impact of sport, whether, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of sort of data out there. Um, and I think part of the challenge at the moment is getting that into schools and getting that, you know, sharing that knowledge, which is why we come back to the point about, you know, the, the fractured and atomized school system where people sometimes aren't sharing um, the excellence, which is, a, which is a very long winded way of saying, you know, we're not going to come into office and, and seek a comprehensive review. What we are going to come in and, and seek to do is, is, is focus, having been in opposition for five long years, uh, focus on what we think uh, the priorities are to implement, and really right at the, the front of that, the early years, the forgotten 50%, the qualified teacher um, in, in the classroom. Claire, I, I, I agree with your, your critique on, you know, we know that schools succeed when communities are engaged uh, with them. We know that schools succeed when parents ask their children what they did um, at school and parents feel welcomed into that school themselves not always having had a great experience of school. Um, and I think, you know, certainly some of the, the pioneering schools in Stoke on Trent, actually a lot of work is going on in adult education for parents of children so that they feel confident about supporting their kids' uh, learning. So schools need to be open uh, to the community, but they also need to look beyond it. They need to look out and they need to be challenged and they need to, you know, um, be told, um, you know, where things are falling down, where things are falling down, where excellence is, where, where they're not achieving excellence. So it's it's that balance, and and, and the great heads um, and the great uh, school management manage to do uh, uh, both. The PFI, as, as Christine said, is uh, disastrous. The good news is that thanks to some devious work we're doing, uh, we're getting more and more schools out of their PFI contracts uh, locally. Um, because uh, some of them are absolutely horrendous. Um, Lid on, on the, the teaching maths, that, you know, I'm sorry to hear about that experience. Um, when I go and sit in classes, and this is why I'm always in awe of, of teachers, the best teachers will know the mix of their class, uh, will know the, the talented students in that particular subject, will know those who need uh, more help. But we'll also know where those children who aren't saying anything but also need assistance are because they've seen in the workbooks that it's not happening. And, and they manage that. And, and it's always really upsetting to hear of it when it, when it falls uh, through the cracks. And what's important, I think, is that as, as, as grandparents and, and as parents, you have voice and can go into the school and have a conversation about it's not happening. I think one of the things I'm interested in pursuing is we have a lot of data and information in our school system which goes up to head teachers, to Ofsted, to all sorts of systems. I don't think, and I say this as a, a parent as well, uh, that there at times there's enough information going out uh, to parents um, as to what's going on uh, with their child. You get, you know, yes and no on, you know, phonics. You get, you know, your 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 end of year sort of data, but actually, uh, in terms of how your child. Um, is doing, um, it's, it's often lost amidst all the minute information which is going up the academy chain or Ofsted or, um, or, or, or elsewhere. Um, the, Jackie, I think, I think you're right about um, the, the, the challenge um, facing teaching those with disabilities. We, we will, I mean, we have a rising participation age to 17 now. It's going to go uh, to 80, um, and the system needs to deal f fairly uh, and appropriately with, with all learners. Um, and we have to make sure, from a teacher training point of view, um, that, that, there, that there's capacity for that, which goes back to the, the point we were making earlier, that an ever narrower teacher training system on the school direct model, which doesn't include all these other demands that, 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 
uh, are required of, uh, of teachers uh, sometimes um, um, uh, inhibits their, their ability to be great teachers for, for all learners. But I want to uh, I want to end by thanking you all uh, for coming here this evening. I want to um, thank those of you who are uh, teachers, those of you who are teaching assistants, those of you who are governors in particular. I want to thank governors. We need more governors in the city, more people willing to uh, act um, as governors. Uh, and I want to thank those of you. Academies are getting rid of them. We want people involved in academies and non academies. We want people involved in all school uh, types. Um, and I want to thank you as parents and grandparents and carers. Um, as well, because we do, we have more work to do uh, in this city on education attainment. The, the, the great historic irony, in a sense, of, of Stoke on Trent is this is a city known around the world for some of the greatest skills in the world. It produced things of the most extraordinary beauty, which are renowned throughout the world. But this is a city also, like Hull, uh, like Liverpool, which, because we had an industrial structure, which meant young people at school didn't need formal qualifications to have a long career in employment, um, often that culture of formal education and learning wasn't there. But we now need it more than ever for our young people to get the jobs of the future. So this is a, a big challenge, a generational challenge, and I think head teachers and teachers are stepping up to it at the moment, and we have to do more to support them. Thank you. I think you, you would agree this has been a, a very good and interesting debate. Uh, we could go on much longer, but unfortunately we, we do have to finish there. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, both Tristram and Christine for giving up their Friday evening to, to come and speak to us. And I'm, and I'm sure uh, you'll be greatly appreciated by yourselves. I'd also like to thank all the people who spoke from the floor for their contribution to the debate. And, and to apologise for anyone who we couldn't fit in. Um, so thanks to those. And finally, I'd like to thank the um, staff at the Mitchell Theatre for accommodating us, and especially the technical staff for sorting out all sorts of technical uh, issues before the um, meeting started. And of course, thanks to the um, officers of the Pensioners Convention and, and the Trades Council and, and Stoke-on-Trent uh, and Staffordshire NUTs for uh, organising this meeting. Um, as you go out, uh, there are some stalls outside, so I'll just draw your attention briefly to those. Uh, we have a stall from the North Staffordshire People's Assembly Against Austerity, who, who are seeking um, uh, your support. Uh, there's a stall selling Palestinian produce, uh, such as olive oil. Uh, the Pensioners Convention have a stall, so please go and talk to them. And finally, National Union of Teachers have a stall. So if you want to know more about the Stand Up for Education um, campaign, please go and talk to them. So thanks. Thanks to you all for coming. Thanks to everybody. And, and thanks again to our two speakers. Thank you.